Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. The character of Vampirella was created in 1969, which means that she's 50 years old this year. That's an incredibly impressive feat for an independent comic book character. At the same time, she doesn't necessarily have a classic storyline or run that fans will point to. And critics will say that she was just designed for cheesecake appeal for the male gaze. But if you really look at Vampirella, she has an incredibly impressive pedigree behind her. A lot of big name creators helped design this character and her costume was actually created by a feminist. So let's take a look today at Vampirella's history and try to find the best runs in her 50 years so that we can try to understand what has created such enduring appeal for this character. Vampirella debuted in her self-titled magazine in September of 1969 from Warren Publishing. Warren Publishing was founded by James Warren in 1957 with magazines discussing movie monsters. Famous Monsters of Filmland and Monster World were their two big titles, and both were edited by Forrest J. Ackerman. If you watched my episode on the history of cosplay, you'll recall that Ackerman was a pioneer in the world of science fiction and fantasy. He was a writer and editor and is created with wearing the first cosplay costume to a convention and inventing the term sci-fi. Warren broke into the comics world in 1964 with two anthology titles, Creepy and Eerie. They were similar to the popular horror anthologies published by EC Comics like Tales from the Crypt. But when the Comics Code was formed in 1954, it drove EC Comics out of business by banning a lot of horror elements in comics. Warren skirted that issue by publishing their comics as black and white magazines, thus not held to the same rules as comics. Their horror comics were popular, so five years in, Warren and Ackerman decided to launch a third horror title, this time with a female host for the stories. This became Vampirella. I can't find any evidence confirming this, but I've always had a suspicion that Ackerman and Warren may have been influenced by the TV hostess Vampira, who had a popular TV show in the mid-50s when she would host horror movies on TV. Again, it's just a suspicion. It could be nothing more than a big coincidence. The costume was designed by comics artist Trina Robbins, who would go on to be a feminist voice as well as a pioneer in underground comics. She would later become the first female artist on a Wonder Woman title, when she illustrated a limited series in 1986. Robbins designed the skimpy bathing suit because she understood the book was supposed to be fun and sexy. She recounts describing the costume to artist Frank Frazetta, who was selected to paint the cover to the first issue. As Robbins recounts, Frazetta made it smaller and smaller each time. Frank Frazetta was an incredibly successful painter and illustrator for comics, novel covers, and related fantasy projects. Frank Frazetta actually created a small museum dedicated to his original paintings, and he had that on his property, a massive, something like 64-acre uh, home, out in Pennsylvania. And I actually got to visit it back in 2005. I spent quite a bit of time talking to his wife who helped me understand Frank Frazetta's uh, history, his career, his techniques. It was a wonderful day. Uh, and there I got to see a lot of the characters that he helped envision. Uh, characters like Vampirella, Conan the Barbarian, his own creation, Death Dealer. It was amazing to see these paintings in person. And Frank Frazetta deserves an episode all to himself. But at this point in time, he was actually still pretty new to comics and still making a name for himself. Ackerman used Vampirella as a hostess, and she would also get one of the anthology stories to herself each issue. Her initial appearances are light and full of puns. It's also designed to titillate the readers, as her first story features her naked taking a shower for the first two pages. It adds nothing to the story, but it sets the tone. Her origin is that she's from a planet named Draculon, where everyone is a vampire, and they drink blood which flows like water in their rivers. Draculon eventually suffers a drought. A spaceship crashes and Vampirella investigates, discovering human astronauts. 
She drinks from them, and in issue two, we're told she was clever enough to repair the ship and come to Earth, where she discovers there's plenty of blood to be found in the people walking around. She wins a costume contest, and the story ends with her plane to Hollywood being struck by lightning and the newspaper saying everyone on board was killed. However, the temporary hostess of the issue, Draculina, Vampirella's blonde twin sister, reveals Vampirella ate everyone. The stories would end with horror twists, but did not feature grisly violence. That mostly took place off-panel for the first seven issues. By the eighth issue, Vampirella's stories became longer and more serious. In that issue, she wanders, wounded in the mountains, and is rescued by a doctor at a mental health facility. The book introduces supporting characters like the blind vampire hunter Conrad Van Helsing and his son Adam, a future love of Vampirella's. A nurse at the hospital is revealed to worship Chaos, the ruler of hell, and Vampirella stops her, becoming a hero who only drinks the blood of evil people. Later mythology explained Dracula came from Draculon, but was corrupted by Chaos, and that's where evil vampires come from. Vampirella also loses her wings in that story, but retains super strength, the ability to turn into a bat, and mesmerism. She has the traditional vampire powers, but no weaknesses to sun, garlic, or crosses, since she's an alien instead of a true vampire. By issue 12, Spanish artist Jose Gonzalez became the primary artist on the title. He continued working on the book through issue 82 in 1979. The title used a great deal of artists from South America and Europe because Warren could pay them less, which helped them remain competitive. Still, by 1983, Warren Publishing had to declare bankruptcy, as they were not selling anywhere near what they sold in their heyday. James Warren was dealing with poor health, and the company was spending more on overhead after moving from Philadelphia to New York, and the distribution model went through significant changes. Warren wasn't able to keep up, and Vampirella went into a period of hibernation after issue 112, a significant run nevertheless for a publisher other than Marvel or DC. At this point in time, Harris Publications bought Warren Publications' entire catalog, although in an ongoing lawsuit they weren't able to use Eerie or Creepy. They ultimately lost the rights to those in 1999 in a lawsuit with James Warren himself. But in 1988, they did publish a new issue of Vampirella. However, they called that issue 113. They designed it to look like the old series, and it was comprised of reprints. It was probably just to test the waters and to retain the rights. It did not sell that well. The Warren era featured a long run that featured some gorgeous artwork and a large amount of world building. But did it make Vampirella a compelling character? That's the consistent criticism throughout her history, that she is most notable for her revealing costume. It's a tough question to answer, but within the context of the character, I'd argue the suit makes sense. Vampirella is very powerful and very sexual. She wears what she wants to wear and is in control of her own life. That said, she's written in this ideal way by mostly male writers and artists. And while she would go on to have a number of memorable stories, most of the time her sales figures are relatively low. It's hard to know who exactly her fans are and how diverse they may or may not be. Following the Warren issues, Harris published several miniseries by a variety of creators from 1991 through 2007. It can be difficult for a completist because this era featured a lot of one-shots, crossovers, and limited series by different writers. Vampirella got a burst of popularity with her crossovers with other sexy female protagonists, and her covers tended to be lumped in with the bad girl art trend at the time. In the 90s, a style of art called bad girl art became popular. This was a response to the term good girl art that referred to artwork from the 1930s comics through about the 1970s that would feature young, attractive women in skimpy clothing or provocative poses. The phrase referred to good art featuring girls, as compared to referring to good girls. The 90s term, bad girl art, came about because there were a lot of sexy anti-heroes or bad girls that became a popular trend. Characters in this group included Lady Death, she, Witchblade. 
Vampirella would have crossovers with She and Witchblade, Shadowhawk, and many more. But this era also featured some of Vampirella's most notable stories. In Vampirella Monthly's first six issues, big name writers Grant Morrison and Mark Miller teamed up to tell a story of a huge vampire conspiracy taking over organized crime across the U.S. and building themselves up to take down Vampirella. It's completely bonkers and features ninja nuns on top of Vampirella's battle with an organized vampire army. Another strong run is Vampirella Lives by Warren Ellis, with art by Amanda Connor. It redefines Vampirella's origin to say that she's the daughter of Lilith, the rejected first wife of the biblical Adam. It's a lot less sci-fi and a lot more horror. One more recommendation from this era is Bloodlust, with painted artwork by Joe Juscu. The story is set in Draculon, which is revealed to actually be in hell, not another planet, and it's like some sort of post-apocalyptic Mad Max story, with Vampirella teaming up with her dead boyfriend Adam Von Helsing. It's worth it just for the fun fantasy art. By 2007, the comics from Harris Publications weren't selling that well, and Harris opted to sell Vampirella to Dynamite Entertainment. Uh, basically, Harris Publications is a large conglomerate of a lot of different interests, and I guess the margins on comics just weren't important enough to them uh, anymore. So they sold off their interests and got out of the comics business completely. In 2010, Dynamite Entertainment started publishing Vampirella comics, both new and reprints. Now, one of the things that's especially useful to readers that want to get up to speed with Vampirella is what's called the Masters series that uh, Dynamite publishes, and that's a series of trade paperbacks that collect stories by some of the top-tier talent that they've had work on, on the character in the past, which includes the three storylines that I just mentioned to you. Uh, they also publish a number of new storylines. In fact, one more run worth mentioning is a year-long run by horror writer Nancy Collins through Dynamite. Vampirella goes on a worldwide quest, which takes her up against vampires that are taken from various cultures' mythologies, from Nosferatu to the flying head and lungs type monsters from Asia. It's a cool adventure that shows you a lot of types of vampires. Vampirella is probably still best known for her revealing costume. But characters who fly under the radar are often the ones creators can take the biggest chances on. Plenty of big names have worked on her and created fun, ass-kicking adventures. Her look is iconic, and her personality is a lot more playful and fun than you might guess. She's evolved from a simple host of stories to a protagonist with a huge mythology tied to demons, monsters, and the modern world. Her stories are unique fun because of her playful attitude mixed with her violent world. A character that can last 50 years has stood the test of time for a reason, and she appears to be in good hands that want to continue to deliver big idea stories and hook a new generation of readers. Vampirella. Sexy. Violent. Fun. Uh, the one piece of Vampirella entertainment, uh, the one piece of media that I would caution you to avoid is her movie. Yes, there was a 1996 direct-to-video movie. You might as well call it direct-to-dump. It's terrible. It stars Mortal Kombat actress Talisa Soto as the titular character, and it involves a storyline where she comes to Earth to get revenge on the vampire that killed her father, and I, he's played by Roger Daltrey of The Who. Uh, the director uh, who has a large career of doing B-movies and soft porn, uh, has basically said that he's ashamed of the movie, that it did not come out the way he intended, and it's not very good. So when even the director, who works on some pretty uh, questionable properties outside of this, says that it's not a good movie, yeah, it's worth avoiding. It's pretty darn bad. What's not bad? Fan art. Let's take a quick look at the fan art that came in this week. Joseph Torres sent in some colorful artwork where I'm the Green Goblin. You can see more of Joseph's work on Instagram. Jeremy Hudson made this piece based off of my Batman Kill Count episode. Jeremy includes links to his Instagram and DeviantArt. Fernando Cuestas illustrated Moon Knight's newest personality, me. Fernando is making art every day of October on his Instagram account. 
Nick O'Connell made a comic strip about people swapping out their hands, and my sidekick Infotron is there to comment. Roberto Amancio from Brazil created a tribute to Rafael Albuquerque's famous Batgirl cover, but with me swapped in. Roberto includes his Instagram for more. Angelo Pijero from Germany sent in artwork featuring Infotron fighting another old robot. You can see more from Angelo on his Instagram page. Brent Hill drew characters from his comic, Triple USA, sporting tattoos of me. You can read Brent's comic on his website, TripleUSA.com. Outlaw Jones illustrated me getting a tattoo while Moon Knight and the tentacles from Johnny the Homicidal Maniac hang out. You can see more of his work on Instagram. Finally, Grimlock has swapped me in for Chuck Norris, which just makes sense. Thanks, Grimlock. Thank you to everybody that sent in fan art this week, and also a super special thank you to my patrons who voted on what we just saw today. They were given several topics uh, for Horror Month, and this was the one that uh, won. So I want to say thank you to everybody that supports me there. That really means a lot to me. Uh, you can support me, uh, or really the channel, I should say, on Patreon. Or if you want to just donate a one-time tip, I have a coffee account. Uh, if you would like to have your artwork featured on this channel, I'm happy to show it as long as it has something to do with comic tropes. Just send it in to comictropes at gmail.com, and I'm happy to show it. Then I will select one of the entrants to win a Gachapon prize, which comes out of the Gachapon machine that was donated by Lunar Shine Store. So we've got eight entrants because the ninth Grimlock said he's already won one, so he can be excluded. We're going to just rotate the ball hopper and see who won a Gachapon prize this week. I'm just going to still shake it around a little. And it's number two. Number two. So that was this artwork. You all can see who that was now. And uh, let's see what you won for a Gachapon prize. I'll be uh, heading over to Japan in less than two months now. What, like about six weeks or so. And I'll get some more Gachapon prizes for now. Looks like you won a... Um, I'm pretty sure this is Liz Sherman from Hellboy. Pretty sure that's who that is. So, uh, send me your... Um, your mailing address. I'll be sure to send this out your way. I hope you all enjoyed this look at a character that um, is essentially an independent uh, character. I mean, Warren Publishing was huge. Uh, Dynamite today is pretty huge, but they're also not, you know, Marvel or DC. And to be around for 50 years, that's a really long time for a comic book character to be around. Uh, I think it's an impressive achievement. There's obviously something to her beyond just being sexy, because uh, anybody can draw something that's sexy. I think that Vampirella actually does have a number of really cool stories. You just have to dig a little deeper to find them. One of the cool things about Dynamite, the current holders of the property, is that they've shown an active interest in reprinting older stories, as well as making new ones. So I think that like that's really good for hooking new fans, because she does have an impressive amount of world building uh, behind her. Anyway, that's all I've got to say this week. I've got some uh, more horror stuff coming up this month. I cannot wait to do next week's episode. It's about one of my all-time favorite comics. That's not hyperbole. It's one of my favorites. I'm very excited for it. Also, I'm doing Inktober every day this month. That means I'm live streaming every single day for about an hour, sometimes more depending on what kind of time I have. I'd love to have you uh, in there. The chat room's open, so if you hit subscribe to my channel and then hit the bell for notifications, you'll get notified when I go live for stuff like that. All right, that's plenty for this week. I'll see you next time, and until then, keep reading comics.